Well, we are in the beautiful grounds of Dunbrody House in what is usually the very sunny southeast of Ireland to catch up with local hero, Tyg Furlong. Thank you, Tyg, for joining me. I see you brought the lovely weather with you. Yeah, you know, you got in a bad day, to be fair. It's been good over the last few weeks, but I think the farmers are happy to see the rain now. That's very true. Grow grass, isn't it? How far away are we from where you would have grown up right now? I'd say two and a half, three kilometres. Okay. So uh, you would have passed it on the way down. So it's more in, it's about two kilometres, three kilometres inland from here, uh, away from the sea. So it's a place called Camp Isle. And yeah, that's where we grew up. When you were a little tyke, growing yeah. up on the farm, what was that like? Did you kind of just follow your dad around? Like what was, you know, what was a day in the life as a little kid growing up on a farm? Obviously, we'd given him a hand. I remember, like, sprung on out calves and, and cleaning up, you know, after cows. And he used to try to make me do chin-ups on the, there's like bars to go across. Well, how many chin-ups did you get? What was your record? I was, I, I was always the same weight as my age when I was growing up. Okay. So I used to actually, believe it or not, be a skinny enough old chap. There's pictures of home me when I was skinny. And I'd be out and about and living on a fairly hearty diet back then, a mm -hmm. black pudding and sausages, like a farmer's <laughs> a farmer's diet. And then Crash Bandicoot came out on the PlayStation oh, and Spyro the Dragon. Yeah. And I went from, from being out and about to be locked in indoors playing that with my brother for six, seven hours. And I just went... Did your dad have to come in and drag you out? Like, did they? Did he send no, you come there in? was a time I remember now. The parents took away the PlayStation <laughs> from us. They used to hide it. Was that now because you were getting in trouble? Or? No, it's because we were getting big as bulls. Like. Oh dear. Yeah, I remember him obviously milking time, and I used to have to go to try to go hurling a football train. I remember trying to go up there and give him a hand so we get up to the pitch on time, etc. You know what I mean? So you played a lot of sports. So you were yeah. Yeah, if you grow up around here, mm. it's. You play hurling and football. Like yeah. That is what you do. I suppose it's the same in any, not rural, because we're not rural here, but country. Mm -hmm. Down the country, you play hurling and football. We had six boys in the primary school class. You had to play to make the team. like, Because we needed 15 players on the pitch. You know that way? You just yeah. That is what you did. Mm -hmm. If you're useless or good, everyone played hurling and football. And that's just the way it is. That's the way you grow up, you know? Yeah, and did you, so say when it came to like the winter time, did you kind of, did you feel yourself kind of really looking forward to, you know, being able to pick up the rugby ball again? Or was there, at that at the young age, did you have a preference or did you not care? I just love sport, yeah. number one. Um, so I don't realise, but my mum tells stories about me practising line out lifting her, and I can't remember any of this, or me trying to tackle her in the kitchen and stuff like that. And, I remember being obsessed with the Six Nations, mm -hmm. the same way I was about Wexford hurling and yeah. football, I suppose, but I was just really obsessed, particularly about Irish rugby. But when you say obsessed, what do you mean? Like, how were you obsessed with it? You just... I just fixated on it and wanted to do it. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to play rugby. I wanted to play rugby for Ireland. Yeah. Um, my father was coaching kind of an age group in Ross, and I remember going in training with him. Um, and going to matches with him, and I tried, to, <laughs> even talking to the players he was coaching out, they're all grown up now, but they said I was the biggest pain in the arse ever. I was out like an eight, nine year old in the middle of their training session trying to tackle them, and do you know that kind of way? Yeah. Um, so that's probably the way I was kind of obsessed with it all. And who, when you were watching like Ireland play on TV, who were you kind of looking at? Who were you drawn to? I do, I love Keith Wood. When I was younger, I loved Pierre Classy, I loved mm -hmm. Mick Galway. I know I'm named, <laughs> I get killed now because I'm naming all the Munster players. Yeah. Um, but I suppose back then that was who he was. And then I loved John Hayes mm -hmm. uh, when he was coming up because he was a farmer too and he was a tight head prop too. And I always, I'd never met John Hayes. And it's one person in rugby I'd love to meet. You've never met John I've Hayes? I've never met John Hayes, no. Oh my God. Well, he's um, here now when he's no, here. <laughs> No, I'd always love to meet John Hayes and just shoot the breeze. And, yeah. Um, I'm sure he'd love to do that too. I'm not sure. I can't speak for John. And now talk to me about then, obviously, the school system and, you know, your pathway into rugby. Because I think in Ireland, you know, there's kind of two pathways into rugby. And you went the less traditional route. Yeah. Yeah. And there's probably a lot made of it. Yeah. It was a lot. Well, at the time, I think it was a, it was a big deal. People view rugby in Ireland as, as a professional game as an elitist, mm -hmm. you know, and there's a lot made of it. All the boys come from private schools, etc. But a lot of those private schools are set up to 
to get people to the pro ranks to win that senior cup etc and there's a lot yeah. of there's so much that goes into it but then when you're from I suppose New Ross like it's not as if we don't like rugby as much or mm. the club doesn't put as much effort in you know it's um, it's a real service to the community yeah. as much as it is anything and I suppose years ago maybe there wasn't a pathway for those kind of players to make it through to the pro ranks but I would have came through the pathway and it was fairly well smooth running when I came okay. through it so if you were good enough you got picked up you got your chance etc and then you know you didn't go the traditional route you you know when you eventually got into the sub academy the academy were you in for a bit of a culture shock then you know when you were mixing with these other kids that would have maybe grown up in the more traditional rugby background or yeah I didn't know what to I left school at 17 yeah uh, leaving Cert Dawn up the road to Dublin. I moved straight up to Dublin for the summer programme because it was we're very far south here and I remember we used to have to train in Dublin three times a week. I was very lucky my mother was a teacher and now Flick could take time if he had to yeah. from the farm because I I don't know how people would have done it without us, you know. Um you know, it was mad the amount of time we spent on the road, mad the sacrifices they made for me to to give me a shot at, you know. Yeah. And then you kind of just went, right, I'm moving up to Dublin at 17. Yeah, yeah. left school at 17, had the car at this stage. Yep. So rather than them driving me up down the summer, I just rented a house, sublet a house off a fella from New Ross who was mm -hmm. in behind, um, in around RTE there in Dublin. Yeah. I wouldn't be the greatest cook now, I'll tell you that. Uh, but mum used to, uh, I ring, the first night in the house anyway, I'd boil in the bag of rice, had to ring my mother how to cook it, how to use a microwave, how to turn on an oven, I was novice. You're an Irish mammy, son. Yeah, yeah. not knowing how proper. to boil a bag of rice. No, boil yeah. a bag of rice. I didn't know clue. Have you ever been, say, when you're like, was it, it whether it was a, like in an Irish dressing room, maybe more so a Leinster dressing room, where you're kind of sitting or you overheard a conversation, like, and it was you just realised you were kind of almost from a different planet. Yeah, yeah. Not so like in in the in the rugby circles, we have something very in common mm -hmm. in terms of you know rugby, the crack around it you know, dressing room crack, etc. But it's when you meet some of the lads and their friends socially, it's just like, Jesus, this is a different planet here. Now, compared to what we used to with with me and my circle of friends, and I'm sure it would be the same for them if they yeah. came down here. And what like was this that I heard the rumour about? You, did you tell Joe Marler you were like a truffle pig farmer? Yeah, I'm not does, telling loads of people that. Does he still believe it? I, I don't know if he believes it or not. I don't know, I've never broached the subject with it again, but yeah. it, it started off, it was me and Tom Denton were sitting down at a dinner table, and it was years ago in Leinster, and we just started making outrageous stories, of, <laughs> like outrageous, I was a truffle farm, we had two pigs, and the lads were all kind of like lapping it up, so we just kept pushing it further and further and further, and we started saying Matilda and, and Molly, and you have to put a muzzle on them, because if they smelled the truffle, they'd just go ape, and you wouldn't be able to hold them back, and we started saying then, and like what kind of sounds the truffle pigs <laughs> like a disco like outrageous like outrageous we we're trying to but then no one copped on right none of the dumb lads copped on so we just kept on at it and we never broke it to him that it was lies like it was complete lies what's the best lie you've told oh do you know the goujon that's another one <laughs> the, uh, I, do you know i was like like I was, we were at a birthday party, uh, 21st in the rugby club in Ross, and my friends will know this story, and we're queuing up the goujons, the so cocktail sausages around and everything, and a, a kind of a red town fella from Ross said behind, oh, goujon, my favourite part of the chicken, he goes, right, right. So then I, I got this in my head about five years later, and I started convincing people that goujon's actually a part of a chicken. And I'd go like, oh, should you know the chicken breast you get? It is a part of a chicken, I'd say. Do you know what? You get a big chicken breast and there's a little sliver of meat <laughs> at the back of it. You're like a chicken breast and then there's a little, the, that extra bit is the goujon. I said to him, and people believe it. <laughs> yeah. Them kind of just outrageous stuff. And I, I quite enjoy that, just feeding them lies and seeing them believe it. Oh, my God. The goujon. Well, um, tell me the story about the summer and the history, it, like this historic win that you guys had in yeah. New Zealand. So that was the first that time was you great. guys toured under under Andy Farrell. Yeah, it was great. It was very, it was very similar or a similar feel to a, a Lions test tour. Okay. Just with the midweek games and stuff like that, the lads bringing it together. Mm. Uh, but it was great. It was great. We had a great, great time. And um, obviously it's, it's great to get the results as well. Joey Carberry! 
will kick to touch to end the game. And Ireland have just had one of their greatest ever rugby days. When does something like that sink in? Like, does it sink in that day like, that you've just made history? Like, how does, like, when does that dawn on you? Is it? I don't know. I don't know. It probably dawns on you straight away, I suppose. Yeah. Um, I know it's great. I probably wouldn't be the over sentimental type myself. Mm. Um, but it's great. I think, I think it's great to look back maybe when you finish your career. And um, you, I suppose you only do history once, don't you? And stuff like that. And to yeah. say, like it was us, it was us, it was our team. It was, we were part of that. You know, it's, it's something no one can ever take away from you, so. It's absolutely incredible. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you for joining me today and uh, for yeah, having the chats. Hey, no panic and thanks for taking the time.